Hello everyone, my name is Brant Kudrowski and this organic chemistry video covers part one of E2 stereochemistry, stereochemistry with acyclic alkyl halides. The E2 transition state has special geometry requirements. The leaving group and the beta proton that's being abstracted must lie in the same plane for the E2 transition state. There are two ways to do that. In this example, we have an alkyl halide with an alpha position that has a leaving group and a beta position that has a hydrogen. And in this case, the leaving group and the beta proton lie in the same plane, but they're close to each other. This is called syn. This conformation is called syn coplanar or syn periplanar, which is an equivalent term. It's also possible to rotate about this single bond. That gives a different conformation of this alkyl halide that has the leaving group and the beta proton in the same plane still. And I can tell because I can see the bonds are all drawn as lines, which means they lie in the plane of the screen. But in this case, the groups are anti to one another. This conformation is called anti-coplanar or anti-periplanar. Syncoplanar is an eclipsed conformation that has high energy. It has steric and torsional strain. Anti-coplanar, in contrast, is a staggered type conformation. It's lower in energy and has a minimum amount of steric strain. Therefore, the anti-coplanar is usually the most important conformation because it's the most stable. So that's the one we're going to focus on and look at primarily in chapter 8. The transition state geometry requirements for the E2 reaction are further described on this slide. The leaving group and the beta proton being abstracted must be in the same plane in the E2 transition state. Here's an alkyl halide example that has the correct geometry for undergoing an E2 reaction. We have our alpha position with a chlorine, the leaving group. We have our beta position with a proton, and this proton lies in the same plane as the chlorine. This is an anti-coplanar type relationship. This alkyl halide has the correct conformation to undergo an E2 reaction, and this beta proton is the one that will get deprotonated. And so as the base comes in, it approaches the beta proton, and it goes through this E2 transition state. Here we have a partially formed bond between the oxygen and hydrogen, a partially broken bond between hydrogen and carbon, a partially formed carbon-carbon double bond, and the leaving group chlorine is in the process of leaving, so that bond is also partially broken. The reason this geometry is required is for orbital overlap reasons. The coplanar transition state is needed for orbital overlap in order to transition from the alkyl halide to the alkene type product. Here's a molecular orbital picture of the transition state. sp3 orbitals are shown for bonds that are breaking. In addition to the major sp3 lobe that's involved in bonding, sp3 hybrid orbitals also have a minor lobe that protrudes out the back side. This is important in the transition state for E2 because these are going to overlap with the neighboring larger lobes to form the new pi bond. This overlap is indicated with the following gray arrows. As the reaction proceeds, the sp3 hybridized orbitals transition into p orbitals in the product alkene. This overlap can only happen if these orbitals are aligned in this way in this anti-coplanar geometry. The transition state of the E2 reaction affects alkene stereochemistry. You should consider the anti-coplanar E2 transition state for each beta proton in a molecule you're considering for reaction. Here's an example of an alkyl halide that has an alpha position with the chlorine leaving group attached and a beta position with two protons. Now, these protons look similar, but they're not the same. If you replace this one with a different group and that one with a different group, you wouldn't get the same compound. You get diastereomers. These protons are called diastereotopic and they react to give different alkene products. Therefore, I'm gonna label them with different labels. I'm gonna call one of them A and the other one B. In this case, there's no beta proton A or B that is coplanar with chlorine. Right now, chlorine is coplanar with the methyl group. This conformation is unreactive in E2. If the molecule were locked into this conformation, it couldn't do E2 at all. However, we can rotate about the bond between the alpha and beta positions. If we rotate so that the HA proton is anti-coplanar with chlorine, we can get to a conformation that is reactive in E2. This species has chlorine leaving group, and one of the beta protons, the HA proton, coplanar with the leaving group. That's shown here. This molecule is reactive in E2 because now the HA proton is coplanar with the chlorine. So a base now is able to abstract the HA proton, and that leads to an E2 elimination reaction where we get a double bond between the alpha and beta positions. Now in this case, the product that comes out has a particular stereochemistry. This is a trans product because the phenyl group and the methyl group are on opposite sides of the double bond that just formed. The reason they're on opposite sides of the double bond is that that's the orientation they had in the transition state. If you look up here at the transition state, the phenyl group is on a wedged bond and the methyl group is on a dashed bond. That's a trans type relationship and that relationship holds through the reaction to turn up in the products. The other products are water and chloride. Let's take a look at the other possibility. 
If we rotate to put HB coplanar with the chlorine leaving group, we can get to a different conformation. In this conformation, we have the HA and the HB protons shown here. Now in this case, it's the HB proton that's coplanar with chlorine. So now HB is the reactive species and that proton can get deprotonated in an E2 reaction. So now a base has the ability to pluck off the HB proton and the electrons can flow to give an elimination product that has a different stereochemistry. This leads to the cis product where the phenyl group and the methyl group are on the same side of the double bond that just formed. The reason that the cis product forms here is that in the transition state, the phenyl group and the methyl group are both on wedged bonds. So they turn up on the same side of the double bond in the product. The other products are water and chloride. Here's another example that illustrates how some isomers can't form in E2 reactions due to transition state requirements. Here's an alkyl bromide. This alkyl bromide has an alpha position with a bromine leaving group, and it has a beta position that has only one beta proton, here shown on a wedged bond. This beta proton is not coplanar with the bromine, and in this conformation, it is unreactive. Here, the bromine is coplanar with the methyl group, so this conformation is not reactive. It can't react in E2. But if we rotate about that central bond, we can put the beta proton anticoplanar with bromine. We can get this different conformation where now the bromine and the beta proton are coplanar. So beta proton is now reactive in E2, and when a base comes by, it can pluck the proton off of the beta position. So now the base can pluck the proton off the beta position to give an alkene between the alpha and the beta carbons along with water and bromide. Notice the stereochemistry in the product. The phenyl groups are cis to each other. This phenyl group and that phenyl group are both on wedged bonds, which indicates they're on the same side of the double bond. They are cis. The reason I can predict that is that in the transition state, both of the phenyl groups have wedged bonds. That's a cis-type stereochemical relationship, and that relationship holds through the reaction on through to the products. This is not the most stable possible isomer of this alkene, but it is the only possible alkene product in this particular E2 reaction. The more stable isomer with the phenyl group trans can't form here because there's no transition state that puts those groups trans and also puts the bromine and the beta proton anticoplanar. This slide goes through another example of how some isomers can't form in E2 reactions due to transition state requirements. Consider this alkyl bromide, where there's an alpha position that has a bromine leaving group and a beta position that has only one proton. Now, in this conformation, the beta proton is not coplanar with the bromine. The methyl group is actually coplanar with the bromine, as indicated by this red highlight. This conformation is unreactive in E2. However, we can rotate around the bond between the alpha and the beta positions to put the beta proton coplanar with bromine. When we do that, this hydrogen is gonna have to go where the methyl group is. The methyl group will then rotate into where the phenyl group is, and the phenyl group will rotate to where the beta proton used to be. To summarize, the hydrogen takes the place of the methyl, the methyl takes the place of the phenyl, the phenyl takes the place of the hydrogen. That rotation gives the following conformation where now the beta proton is coplanar with chlorine and this conformation is reactive in E2. Now it has the right geometry for a base to be able to pluck the proton off of the beta position. Base approaches, attacks the beta proton, deprotonates it, and electrons can flow to form a new carbon-carbon double bond between the alpha and beta positions, resulting in the following alkene. The other products are water and bromide. This is the only alkene product that can form in this reaction because there's only one transition state that puts the leaving group and the beta proton anticoplanar. The other isomer with phenyl group cis can't form here because there's no transition state that supports that substitution pattern. If you found this video useful, check out the next one in the series or watch the prior video. And consider subscribing to my YouTube channel. My name is Brant Kudrowski. Thanks for watching.